My name is Brenda Walker. I'm the National Adult Sport Protection Learning and uh, sorry, I'm the National Adult Sport Protection Coordinator and the chair of the National uh, Adult Sport Protection Learning and Development Network. And it's the network that are bringing uh, this event to you today. Um, so in terms of I'm about to introduce Anne Haynes and uh, probably worth mentioning Anne has very kindly offered to do a bit of input for her colleague Julie who should have been on the agenda after Anne but in fact Julie's off sick today so Anne's going to cover a bit of her input and we'll just we'll just kind of um, tweak the programme if, if we um, we might be lucky enough to, to be finished a couple of minutes early but I, I think I might be being over optimistic with that uh, but we'll tweak the programme uh, as a, appropriate at the time but thank you Anne for stepping in and doing that today. So Anne's a registered social worker she joined the NHS Lanarkshire in 2006 as a gender-based violence manager, and she was responsible for running a specialist trauma-focused service for women who'd experienced abuse and undertaking the role as operational advisor to the board on issues of gender-based violence. And previously worked in North Ayrshire Council, Glasgow City Council and East Renfrewshire as, and with Women's Aid. And Anne has a proactive approach in the strategic and operational development of responses to violence against women. Currently the Vice Chair of North Lanarkshire Strategic Violence Against Women Partnership, Co-Chair of the National Health GBV Leads Network, and she's a member of the National Implementation Group for Trauma-Informed Practice, the National Advisory Group for MARAC, and the nationally and the newly formed Domestic Homicide Review Task. That's quite quite a lot that you're involved with, Anne. So we're Busy. absolutely delighted to welcome you uh, this morning. I, I obviously got to hear about you through the, the Learning and Development Network. It was suggested you make a great speaker. Speaking to you, uh, you know, a couple of times as we have on Teams before today, I, I'm really looking forward to your input. So without further ado, Anne, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Brenda. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to assume that's fine. And can everyone see my first slide? Thank you, Elaine. I can see you nodding. Thank you very much for that. Okay, as Brenda says, I've been asked to come along and look at the two topics around adult support and protection and domestic abuse. And I thought I would frame that in the overlaps that we're aware of and perhaps look at some of the gaps that we're also aware of. Um, just for clarity, this is my thoughts on the topic today. Um, I've got lots of information that I'm going to be putting through these slides for you, so you will get the slides. Um, please just sit back and, and absorb it. Uh, there hopefully will be time for questions towards the end and I will be staying on on the session. Um, I'm going to refer to women throughout and I'll make that apparent why while I'm talking. I realise that the, oh, the um, audience today is very mixed so hopefully that will be helpful and given that this can be an emotive topic and a difficult topic for people if you need to step away or turn your camera off please do that. Okay, so the aims of the session today are that we are going to look at those overlaps and gaps on the public protection issues of, of ASP and domestic abuse. But Elena, I will pull a wee bit of um, child protection in, just as you mentioned that in your introduction. We'll understand what the risk assessment process for domestic abuse looks like and how we escalate to MARAC for very high risk cases. We'll reflect upon the requirements of competency in both areas when you're going to deal with these arenas and hopefully get you to consider next steps in your own area. Now, I'm not going to ask you to take notes throughout apart from at one point just before the case study. So have a pen and pencil ready when we're just about to come into our case study. So let's start off with having a, a wee bit of fun we'll do a quick quiz on polls i'm going to launch a poll and it will come up in the middle of your screen and there are five questions in it if you just go through each question choose your multiple choice answer and then click submit at the end so let's give this a go that makes me sound all techy you know quite amazing here we go launch Is it coming up on your screen for you? Yes, there it's coming now. Can you all see that? I'll read the question out. If, um, yep, I'm getting lots of thumbs up. Fantastic. So don't agonize. 
choose your answers, move on to the questions and click submit at the end. If anyone can't see the polls, then I'll read out the answers at the end, so don't worry. Off you go. should say all your answers are anonymous, but that goes without saying with 190 odd people in the session. So I'm looking at 100 and just about 160 responses so far. We'll give that another wee minute. Okay, I think we're sort of levelling out. There's maybe some people can't get access to it. Thank you very much, everyone. So I'll just go through the answer very briefly with us. So the first question was, how many incidents of domestic abuse were reported to police in Scotland in 21-22? Now, Martin McGee from our area is on the call, so he should know the answer to this. Um, and the answer is C, 64,807. And I see we had a split between that and 65,000 pretty much. So um, most people were in the right vicinity. 65,000 was last year's figures, the year before. So we're all pretty much in the right ballpark. Question two, which age group of victims report most domestic abuse? Um, most people chose A, which is 31 to 35, and that's the correct answer. Um, of course, it goes across the lifespan um, once you start to have relationships, but that is the most prominent reporting group that we see through Police Scotland. Question three, how long do the majority of older women victims wait before seeking support? Now, this was quite an interesting one. We had a split between eight and 12 years and over 20 years. And sadly, the answer is over 20 years for um, older women. So. We're recognising that it takes a long time, but perhaps not really accepting just how long it can be for some people. Number four, what's the likelihood of disabled women experiencing domestic abuse? And almost everyone said the correct answer, C, two times more likely than the general population of women. And the final question, what percentage of reported domestic abuse had a female victim? Now, most people have said 96%. Um, but actually the answer is sitting at 85%. But I would say that there is a caveat around that figure. We've seen that number decreasing over the years, um, but we are aware that there is quite a, a move in terms of counter allegations by perpetrators at the time of instance when the police come out. We also know that within gay relationships, with um, there's abuse that's experienced by men, by men, and... Um, so this doesn't equate to its heterosexual men being abused by heterosexual women. Um, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. So arguably 96% would perhaps be closer to the truth of the ongoing experience of abuse. So well done, everybody. Not bad for a start. So I'm going to start off by talking about the overlaps now. Thank you for putting that in the chat for me there, Holly. Um, the overlaps that we know that exist between adult support and protection arena and the domestic abuse and gender based violence arena. And the, the primary one we've got is human rights. So human rights applies to every individual in the world, but obviously applied by those countries that undertake human rights legislation. Um, and for adult support and protection, it's threaded through 
the underpinning law that we have in Scotland. And for violence against women, it is mostly um, set by international instruments by the UN and other international bodies. So the main one for us is the Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, known as CEDAW, which was created in 1992. Um, and we know that there's been developments in Scotland around adult support and protection, which have now created a suite of legislation which supports that those human rights of feeling included, being respected, being able to feel safe, living without fear of harm, um, and being able to make decisions and choices for themselves and consent to activity freely. So the Adult Support and Protection suite of legislation came about because there was a number of reports that happened, included the Borders Inquiry, which you'll be aware of, that identified there was a gap in legislation. And I know that there are further moves to tighten that up um, more recently and, and that there's work ongoing in that. One of the important things was that this set up a responsibility for public organisations and professionals to support and protect adults within the communities they worked in. It also had a presumption of capacity for people over the age of 16, and that's the same to an extent for gender-based violence, and I'll touch on that later. But as we all know, capacity is not a straightforward issue. It can be quite complicated. It's task specific, and it exists within a continuum depending on what's going on in people's lives. Um, and that's around acting, about making decisions, being able to communicate decisions, understanding decisions and being able to retain memory of them. So I will pick this up again as I go through the themes, particularly around domestic abuse, about how that may fluctuate when someone's experiencing harm. But we all know that we shouldn't generalise capacity in any one uh, across a, an individual's life per se. So another element of the Adult Support and Protection Act was the set up of these principles about striking a balance between freedom of choice, about interventions being reasonable and proportionate, that they must be the least restrictive options chosen. And we have to carefully weigh and consider the principles, particularly where the adult does not wish any support. And those, again, are cross-cutting themes that you can reflect in domestic abuse to a certain extent. So. And then when we think about adults' rights and our role with them, we sit in the middle and we have this balance to make between respecting self-determination, autonomy, and our duty to cooperate, particularly under the ASP, which is quite clearly stated, and a moral obligation around violence against women, because internationally we understand that this is not good for women and girls. And the major interaction in that for us as human beings is about choice and that manifests itself in the form of consent. So that again is similar in terms of domestic abuse, but there are some differences that I'll pick up. And one of those, for example, would be the concept of what you would describe as undue pressure in the adult support and protection arena. Another area of commonality that we're all aware of is the need for interagency collaboration. So again, ASP has clearly delineated duties and responsibilities. It highlights the need for effective intervention, which would be around leadership, workforce development, communication with the community and partnerships and communication between us, and also communication very importantly, with the individual at the centre of it, and your documentation states about and with families. Now, I have to lay a caveat on that in terms of comparisons with domestic abuse, because for domestic abuse, that is typically and primarily where the source of harm lies, unless it's for um, BME communities where the extended family might also be in, uh, a part of the picture. And Elaine, you mentioned the whole families approach earlier, which is obviously a growing and development area. Again, we have to act with caution about blanket approaches to whole families because the perpetrator is located at the centre of our family. So um, it's just something that we are mindful of when we talk about these um, topics. 
And similarly, as I mentioned for GERFEC, for child protection, it's the same. If we've all seen the picture with the wee um, child in the middle with the circle that goes round it about the importance of community elements, the family is the closest to the child in that. And again, that caveat exists for us because that's the source of harm. So when we're dealing with domestic abuse, you really need to have a clear understanding of knowledge of the topic, indicators about and risk factors, as well as applying a gendered lens to it. And I'll explain why that is as we go on. Excuse me. Remnants of the lurky. Um, another aspect of um, that's not changing. Are you with me? OK, why is that not changing? Here we go. Someone's taken control of the slides, have they? Yep, someone has taken control of the slides. OK. Isabel McWilliams, I'm sorry to name and shame, but Isabel, you might have clicked on something. <laughs> um, OK. So I have this, folks. I'll try again. There's Francis looking all amused because I said I had sorted that earlier. Sorry, I must have done that by accident. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, right, we have gone back to the beginning. Bear with me and I'll just move forward. Can you see interagency collaboration again? Thanks very much for noting. Okay. Brilliant. Another area um, of commonality is the concept in adult support and protection about being unable to safeguard. And that particularly loops around issues of capacity, as we've mentioned, control and choice. And I can still see the very first slide. Ah, right, OK. Not great. Um, unable to safeguard, so it is coming on for some of us. Yeah, it's OK for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fine for me as well, Anne. Me too. How are you doing, Brenda? I don't know. Me too. Doing wrong, right? That's fine. I'll just go with it. Anyone else that's having problems? Can you pop it in the chat just so we're aware? Looks like most yep, people. Most people are okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whew. And that's why the joys of teams. Okay, okay. So. In terms of unable to safeguard, we know that people should be able to make choices and that they should be made freely. Um, yeah. And that oh, someone's got their mic on. Um, and that we know that this doesn't necessarily, the adult support and protection legislation doesn't refer to capacity particularly. So we've got the three point criteria that's available, and that is about highlighting whether or not the adult is unable to safeguard their own well-being and property in the first point of the three criteria. Now we've already said that capacity is a fluctuating um, sort of space for people, and it can be dependent on the specific context that's arising. So Francis is going to come on and talk about trauma later. That's one area that we could look at. Um, whether someone has addictions, whether they're um, under undue pressure, experiencing a great deal of stress in their life, a whole range of different things can change how people are able to cope. One that I would bring into the, the discussion would be traumatic bonding. And I don't know if in the adult support and protection arena you particularly talk about traumatic bonding um, commonly, but for domestic abuse, that is something that people are um, subject to. And that's because they're very unhealthily bonded to the individual who is um, perpetrating abuse against them because they're the person that controls whether they live or die, essentially. And so that can be a very, very powerful driver in terms of whether or not people feel they have capacity, whether they have control and whether they have choice within their life. And again, it's not easy, but we can draw comparisons with other ASP elements. And finally, in adult support and protection, we've got the definitions that are very specific in the Act. So the first one of those is that there was a move away from the term abuse and the word harm was brought into the, the lexicon around um, protection and that this the Act stated that harm includes all harmful conduct and gave examples that includes physical harm, it included psychological harm, 
unlawful conduct and the possibility of self-harm. Um, and to meet the second point of the criteria, the adult must be identified as being at risk of harm as a result of another person's conduct or as a result of their own um, conduct through self-harm. Now, these points are all really important because if you then layer on that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the presence of a particular condition in their life is going to cause them to meet the three point criteria. All three elements must be met to be able to apply the legislation under adult support and protection. Um, so it's very much down to the individual about if they know or believe and that it is their decision about the application of that to then be able to justify a defensible decision to move forward under the legislation. So again, there are overlaps with the different forms of abuse, the concept of harm and the concept of whether or not someone is able to um, be identified as an adult at risk. And undue pressure, I'm going to hold because I'm going to come on and talk about that later on when I talk about coercive control. Can, so let's, and, and, yep. can I just introduce, uh, just interrupt you, sorry, because there's a few people still saying they can't see the slides um, oh, or, the, right. or the first slide. So I'm just wondering if uh, if, you, if you reshared um, okay, let me and, let pe and let people catch up um, to Elaine, where you are. Yes, Elaine, it's Brenda. I've just had to come out of the meeting and come back in and that seems to have sorted it for me. OK. Right, OK. Right. So and, and Kelly's got a hand up as well. Um, Kelly. Oh, she's gone. Never mind. Right. Sorry, Anne. Carry, carry on. Okay. Carry on. Keep calm and carry on. Okay, bear with me. You should be able to see my first slide again, and I'm now going to move forward. Can you see definitions of gender-based violence? Get lots of thumbs up. Fantastic. Hopefully that has set it for everyone. Sorry about this, folks. OK, so we looked at adult support and protection and the specifics around that. We'll now move on to looking at the specifics within gender based violence and where we know there are overlaps with ASP. So this is contained within Scotland's definition. Uh, this is the definition that's used in the Equally Safe Strategy, which is Scotland's strategy around um, gender based violence and domestic abuse. So it says that gender based violence is often referred to as gender based abuse or violence against women and girls. And that's an umbrella term that encompasses a spectrum of different types of abuse, which is mostly experienced by women and girls and perpetrated mainly by men. And you'll see the similarities there. We've got physical, sexual, psychological abuse. We've, we have additions around harassment and stalking commercial sexual exploitation, which would include prostitution, pornography, trafficking and harmful cultural practices, which um, includes things like so-called honour based violence, forced marriage and female genital mutilation. And these are extracted from the UN definitions around violence against women. There are further descriptors that are used, which says very clearly that it is violence that is directed against a woman simply because she is a woman and that affects women disproportionately. Um, and as well as those particular acts and experiences there that are described also highlights about threats of such acts, coercion is mentioned and other deprivations of liberty. And that comes from the CEDAW documentation that I mentioned earlier on. So those for coercion here, it can be everything from war crimes where um, women have to accept being raped and to mean that their children don't get killed, right down to local um, community experiences just now of women having to exchange sex to be able to afford their rent. So coercion can mean lots of different things um, and I will specifically look at what we mean by coercive control shortly. The crucial thing that's very different from adult support and protection is this, this gender specific aspect of it. It is a function of gender inequality and therefore the recognition of an abuse of male power and privilege that creates the conditions for this, whether that's happening in public or private life. Um, and you can't understand 
domestic abuse and other forms of gender based violence without understanding that subordinate position in society of women and girls. Um, and therefore, you have to understand the social norms and the, the framework that wraps around it um, to truly be able to address gender based violence. And that theme carries through into the Scottish Government's definition of domestic abuse. And you'll see there that domestic abuse as gender based abuse and very specifically named. We have it's um, perpetrated by partners or ex partners, and then it includes that range of behaviours that we've already talked about that we know is the overlap. But at the bottom there, we've got withholding money and other types of controlling behaviour, including isolation, racial abuse, verbal abuse. So none of that refu you know, denies the existence of violence against men and violence within same sex relationships. But it's really about understanding that gender based violence is both a cause and a consequence of gender inequality and that we have to be able to understand that to be able to address it properly through our actions and our legislation. And originally legislation only um, picked up on physical abuse, essentially, um, and the government has worked very hard recently. We've now got the Domestic Abuse in Scotland Act from 2018, which picks up those elements of controlling behaviour, isolation, things that weren't classed as criminal activity previously. And more recently, we also have the Domestic Abuse Protection Scotland Act, which brings specific measures in to be able to protect um, women who are experiencing abuse. And finally, um, just the final part of overlaps I want to highlight is that within gender based violence, and we talk about all these different topics that are on the left hand side there, um, we know that these are not discrete, that they are often interconnected and particularly within the experience of domestic abuse, we see rape and sexual assault occurring regularly, we see stalking and harassment, some women may be prostituted by their partner, um, and that's all part of the um, the mixture for individuals around domestic abuse. So the overlaps are that whilst they might be our themes, your process might be the response to some of those. We also know that there's commonalities around stigma and myths appropriate to, uh, that are applied to people. There's victim blaming, there's shame and there's guilt for individuals. And we also know there's under reporting and sometimes weak and underused sanctions and certainly low levels of conviction for people who perpetrate both gender based violence and adult support and protection concerns. So I tend not to talk about the vulnerabilities of the individual. I tend to talk about risk factors. I apply the themes, I look for cross cutting connections and the themes and the impacts of that. And that's very much for our work about keeping the perpetrator at the centre and visible and less about focusing on um, uh, the, the vulnerabilities of the individual themselves. Another part that will tie into what Francis is talking about later is these central features that are in GBV that are also able to be applied to adult um, abuse. And that's that there's usually an abuse of power, there's a betrayal of trust, there's a denial of your right to feel safe and valued, and that loss of control, certainly for women, over their own body, as well as other areas of their own life. There's a violation of their personal boundaries, and that impacts on their sense of self by creating psychological distress. And that imbalance of power in society or within the relationship is crucial um, to how disruptive it can be because it's very close and personal to the individual. So now you're going to go into breakout rooms in a wee minute and Holly's going to do the magic for that. I did mention that I'd ask you to have a pencil ready. I'm going to give you two questions for you to discuss in your groups. And those questions are, what risk factors can you identify in the scenario I'm going to give you? And how might domestic abuse be missed in the scenario that I'm going to give you? OK, I'll well, read out the, the um, scenario now and then Holly will pop you into groups. So two questions, listen to the detail. So Margaret, 75, and Alistair, 76, have been married for 48 years. They've got three adult daughters who all live some distance away. They see their family mostly at birthdays and holidays and occasionally over a weekend. 
Margaret is a retired school teacher and Alistair was a retired police officer. A few years ago, Margaret was diagnosed with osteoporosis and she's got hypertension, low blood pressure, which can cause dizziness for her. In the last 12 months, Margaret has presented at A&E five times. She's had bruising and on three occasions, she's also suffered some minor fractures. Each time, Margaret is advised that she's either had a fall at home or bumped into something or similar explanations. At each visit, Alistair has been present with her and he appears to be very attentive to Margaret. On the most recent visit, um, staff noticed that Alistair was finishing Margaret's sentences for her and also noticed that she'd some fingerprint marks on her arms. Alistair explained that this happened when he was trying to help his wife up from her fall. So, into groups, two questions, what risk factors can you identify and why might this be missed as domestic abuse? Okay, so I gave you the scenario of um, Margaret and Alistair. Uh, the key questions I'd given you were what risk factors were you be able, able to identify and how might domestic abuse be missed in this scenario? So, the key risk factors that I would have said that you'd have been looking for were indicators that Margaret appears to be fairly isolated in the relationship because she doesn't have contact with her adult daughters. There's obviously her age to be taken into consideration. And we've got that ever present um, aspect of Alistair being there at all points when she's been spoken to by professionals. We've obviously got the fact that she's got some physical health conditions and she's now starting to sustain injuries as, apparently as a result of those um, physical conditions about falling and being dizzy and stuff. And we've also got quite a, bit, a high frequency of visits that she's come to A&E uh, and sought support from medical professionals. So I would hope if you've picked up most of those, that those were fairly obvious in the scenario. And if anyone's got any additional ones, as I say, feel free to pop them in the chat. Thank you for the people that have popped into the chat that your rooms worked well, and I'm really sorry for pulling you a wee, early, a wee bit early. Um, yep, yeah, so Rona, you've mentioned lack of routine inquiry. I'm going to be picking <coughs> that up later. So in terms of how it might have been missed, absolutely not asking Margaret in the first place, not having private time with her to see if there might be any other concerns. Um, he was a police officer, potentially with prior knowledge of how to, to present, absolutely. Um, that's a really good point. So some of the other elements we were talking about that you could talk about in terms of things that could mean you miss it, you might have staff who are very busy. You might have staff who only see the age of the people in front of them and don't think about it from a domestic abuse point of view. Alistair, to all intents and purposes, presented as a very caring husband, and why would someone question that? Um, there was nothing overt in the scenario that I gave you. Um, everything was technically clinically explainable. So I'm going to do a very quick instant poll with you. We're going to do thumbs up or thumbs down. Do you think this was an adult protection? Would you have done an AP1? Click on the poll. Oh, I'm getting thumbs up rather than mostly thumbs up. Yep. Brilliant. OK, so actually quite a lot of you think there is justification for completing an adult protection that you consider. With that scenario, I've given you Margaret meets the three point criteria. That's quite interesting in itself, because I would say that there isn't actually enough impetus within that scenario. There's certainly impetus for you to make further inquiries and, and get an opportunity to speak to her alone, perhaps arrange follow up to try and speak to her. You might put a flag on the system. Um, some people might do nothing. Very much depends. So, so that's just um, shows that there is personal decision making and professional decision making that takes place within any one of these scenarios that I could have put to you. What we do know is that the consequences of abuse can, of course, be extensive. And we see that Margaret is attending A&E regularly. 
some of the examples that we're aware of is that one in five high risk victims of domestic abuse reported attending A&E. We've got, um, as well as short term injuries, there's a whole range of physical health consequences. And this isn't a specific training programme about domestic abuse, but that information is available if you want to contact me. Um, it often leaves victims with reproductive health consequences, um, sexually transmitted infections, pregnancy, um, internal injuries. And we know that 40% of high risk victims also report having mental health issues. We see significant psychological consequences and um, that would be described in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder or specifically for domestic abuse complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And one study showed is that between 30 and 60% of psychiatric inpatients had experienced domestic abuse. And that's something we need to be very mindful of about the, the higher end of the spectrum. The main thing is that with domestic abuse, it can be really chronic and repetitive. It's not one off instance that we're talking about that can cause harm. The final area before we take a wee break is the sort of final area of commonality I think we can all recognise is that there's a, there can be a great deal of judgment applied both in the arena of adult protection and around domestic abuse and other forms of gender based violence. Um, we can see particular perspectives that take place expectations of those perspectives, judgments, bias, um, or comparisons being made. They can be quite deliberate discrimination or they can be indirect and they can have intended consequences or unintended consequences. And that's on an interpersonal level as well as an institutional level. And whilst we know it's really important that people should make their own autonomous choices, even if we consider them to be unhealthy or risky, um, for gender-based violence and specifically for domestic abuse, I'd argue that very specific layer about gender inequality is crucial because we very often see the idea of deserving and undeserving women, women who have made their bed so they have to lie in it, they have to just suck it up. Um, so ours is very strongly influenced by sex and by gender norms. Um, and they are hugely powerful, invisible and embedded in our society. And they, but they can also be quite overt. Um, so even just the concepts of capacity, uh, choice and risk are heavily laden with judgment for women. And that can be very detrimental. So in adult protection, you'll use the term around paternalistic practice about being overly interventionist um, for domestic abuse. Our main concern is around patriarchal practice um, and how that prevails. And I suppose none so more so than in child protection, where we see that women are blamed for failing to protect their children when there is no mention of who the perpetrator is and that keeping him at the focus of that. So on that note, we're going to have a comfort break for 10 minutes. Um, if you can be back, that's 10.34 on my computer. If you can be back in 10 minutes, we'll move on to the second part of the session. Thanks very much, everyone. OK, now we're going to move on to where we um, start to diverge. Um, where we've looked at what the commonalities are, we're going to look at some specific differences. First one I draw attention to is the concept of being unable to safeguard. Um, and we know that we've talked about capacity control choice. Um, that first criteria being described as unable to safeguard is a bit different when we then ask the question, how might a person be able to safeguard themselves if they're experiencing domestic abuse? Um, and it's not that one way is right or wrong, it's just that we tend to apply a, a more positive lens on it. What is she able to do to protect herself? Because it's not just the big physical stuff and the big um, financial fraud that um, we focus in on. In lots of ways, the work we do is about the micromanagement of daily life. And that takes place in all sorts of ways where liberty is infringed on a daily basis and eroded. Um, it can be 
not been able to go to your bed till he says so, having to ask for sanitary products. Some women we know have to ask for toilet paper. Um, you've got to go to the toilet with the door open. It can be a whole host of different things. It can be him going and spending the whole household budget, getting drunk with his friends, and then you being held to account by services because the children appear not to have enough food. So there's all sorts of ways. And um, what we describe that as is limiting her space for action. So she has action, but it is limited by his um, perpetration of abuse on her. So we have an, a, a, a slant towards operating an empowerment model, and that's in clear recognition of the fact that the core elements of domestic abuse is about disempowerment and about power and control by the perpetrator. So we acknowledge that she's not passive in this process. She might have only a tiny space for action, but she's not passive and she does try to make things better for herself. I'm just going to briefly tell you a brilliant story that um, has always stuck with me from our colleague who works in the Women's Support Project. She'd been on Scottish Women on the telly years ago. And a couple of days later, she was walking through Easter House and a woman said to her, you're that woman that was in the telly. I saw you in the telly. And she said, uh -huh. and she said you know, all these years I thought I was just loving my bastard excuse my French, but it epitomised the banality of that micromanagement of daily life that is really hidden in plain view for women. And for some, it's just life uh, and they don't know that it's something different. So minimisation can be a psychological protection um, and stigma and shame can pe keep people quiet as well. So we tend to veer on that side of looking at ability rather than inability. And in terms of your three point criteria, the two yellow ones are what would make you have to make a professional judgment around domestic abuse. Of course, she's at risk of harm, but is she unable to safeguard um, a, a range of elements of her life? And does she actually have a disability, a mental disorder or a physical or mental infirmity? And that's going to be very specific to the individual. So. It's not that necessarily adult support and protection blanketly can be pro, uh, um, applied to domestic abuse in all cases. But that doesn't mean to say that if it, ASP legislation doesn't apply, then you do nothing. There are lots of other things that we can suggest that you can do as a route for action. Now, one of the things Brenda had asked me to do originally was to talk about coercive control. Um, and of I've sort of prepared this couple of minutes for you so that we're quite clear about why we use the term coercive control. So adult protection talks about undue pressure and the notes I've got here say it may be applied to prevent the person seeking help or to influence decisions they make, um, leaving them at risk of harm. Um, but the outcome may or may not directly benefit the person who is applying the pressure to them. We also see the word coercion in lots of documentation. And coercion implies the use of force or threats of force that typically will benefit the other party. Other terms you might know, and particularly around domestic abuse, you might hear about gaslighting, um, which is a form of psychological manipulation. And the abuser specifically attempts to sow self-doubt and confusion with the individual in the victim's mind. And that is about power and control, but that doesn't necessarily only happen in a domestic abuse scenario. So these are all quite similar terms, but they're also quite different. So therefore, the term coercive control, I would argue, is very specific to domestic abuse. And it was first noted in about 1987 in health guidance, actually, which was saying that it's really only physicians and nurses that are able to identify domestic abuse because it was only perceived as um, physical assault. And then we moved into the arena of there's a book in 1999, which was called Batter Women, Battered Women in the Courtroom by James Hachek. Um, and he recognised that criminal activity um, has to be more broadly understood in terms of domination and isolation and coercive control. But the real sort of landscape breaker for us is this book by Evan Stark, which he called Coercive Control, which he wrote in 2007. And Evan drew all that together and highlighted clearly that this is not crime, uh, primarily a crime of violence, but a liberty crime against women. 
and that it's not experienced in instance, it's experienced as ongoing and that it involves a level of entrapment where they have choice, but they have no choice. Um, and that ties in with Judith Thurman's model around trauma and recovery, where she um, drew comparisons with violence against women and prisoners of war and torture experiences. Evan talked about that lack of space for action that I mentioned earlier and highlighted that violence, whilst it's part of the toolkit, it's possibly the least perfect tool available because that's the one that's very visible and gets them caught. So that is then coupled with isolation, threats, and that micromanagement of daily life that I talked about, because that keeps it in check and it enables him to maintain his control. And very importantly, it doesn't just happen in the home, it crosses social space. And that's why the definitions of domestic abuse highlight ex-partners. It can go on for many, many years of continued stalking and harassment. So the next layer of, sort of theory to apply is work by Michael Johnson, Michael P. Johnson, and he described a typology of domestic violence. And that was in 2008, and he coined the phrase intimate terrorism. And at the time, it was quite controversial because it uses the word terrorism, obviously. But what he did was he created a framework of three different types. There's situational couple violence, where there are couples who just resolve their conflicts by the use of violence. And there's also violent resistance with someone who's experienced abuse for a long time who finally lashes out. And that is typically when you see women who have killed their male partners. And he placed intimate terrorism in the middle of that. And that's what we would describe as domestic abuse. And then most recently, we've got the fantastic work of Jane Monkton Smith, her book In Control, Dangerous Relationships and How They End in Murder. And Jane created what we know as the Homicide Timeline, which is a series of steps that follow a pathway that show the further up that pathway a perpetrator gets, they lose any concept of the need to, to continue to maintain a front and it can lead to murder. So these three pieces are really specific about understanding why coercive control is very particular to domestic abuse. And I would ask that we don't misuse the term coercive control, absolutely talk about undue pressure, talk about coercion, but coercive control is very much in the landscape and the research that's been done around domestic abuse. We also know that there are differences in the way that we're required to work together. So for adult protection, the ARC, the ARC formalised the need for good communication. It highlighted that there must be multi-agency committees with governance in place for adult protection and that we must operate a multi-agency model which has lead agencies and lead roles within that. It also provided a range of orders that were able to be enacted for protection purposes. Now, I mentioned earlier about the Domestic Abuse Protection Act 2021, and it brings two main orders in, which is a domestic abuse protection notice and domestic abuse protection orders. Um, and they have different roles and different timescales. We also have interdicts, perhaps with or without power of arrest, which have been around for a very long time. We have known harassment orders available, and we also have exclusion orders that can happen through child protection. But a lot of these things require women to apply for legal aid and approach the court for them. They're not built into a legislative framework that has a structure where society protects her. She has to go and seek that protection. And then we've got differences in the duties and powers that I mentioned. So there is a statutory duty in adult protection, but no equivalency currently for gender-based violence and domestic abuse. And I'll explain what that looks like in a minute. There's no compulsion and duty to report around domestic abuse the same way there is for adult protection. And there is no compulsion or obligation to cooperate the same way there is in adult protection, other than around aspects of prevention of crime which I will highlight in a wee minute. So where adult protection says, if you know or believe, if you know there's some compulsion to act around domestic abuse, but if you believe and you don't have evidence, then that becomes quite different. And really consent rules the roost in terms of domestic abuse practice at this point in time. So in terms of obligation to act, there is no obligation around trafficking, 
There's none for rape. There's none for commercial sexual exploitation. There's none for adult disclosures of um, female genital mutilation, other than if they're going to go in and have female children around the protection of female uh, around girls. Where there is movement is around domestic abuse. Um, and one of the pieces of legislation that was really key to this was a case that took place in 1999 known as the Osman ruling. And that stated that there was a failure of agencies to act on information they held when there was a murder. The state had a positive obligation to take preventative measures to protect individuals who were at risk of the criminal activities of others. And that's really important. That then spawned the idea that the police, when they might not have complete evidence to be able to put a case through to court, that they are obliged to undertake what we call an Osman letter. They will go out and they will notify people that they are at risk of harm by the, the criminal activities of others. And these things were partly the foundation for the development of MARAC, which I'm going to come on and give you some more information about. So there were three main legislative um, areas that supported the really innovative practice about the recognition that there was a duty on us um, as state actors to do something, even if we didn't have the instruments available to us in legislation. So the Human Rights Act has three different parts to it. The right to life, and that's where the Osman ruling applied the right to be free from torture. And in the case of Zed and others from 2001, that clearly stated that authorities should have acted to prevent ill treatment where they had or ought to have had knowledge of something. And that's a really important distinction. And then also um, Article 8 is around right to privacy. We don't go dabbling around in people's um, life unless we absolutely have to. The other two pieces of legislation was the Local Government Scotland Act of 2003, and that stated that areas, local authorities had the power to advance wellbeing um, and the power to do anything which they considered was likely to promote and improve the wellbeing of people in their area. So that was permission to act, to put something in place that was used. And then we've got the Data Protection Act and GDPR, and that's about the allowance of processing personal data when it's about criminality. And very specifically for MARAC, we can provide information without consent if it's in the vital interest of others, and not tell the subject that we're going to share it because it would create further harm. So those are the key elements that supported the shift in the national landscape around domestic abuse. Excuse me. Other differences is we have the equally safe strategy, but not the same underpinning legislative basis as I've already mentioned. We've got certain levels of protection available to us through activities at Police Scotland, like the fantastic Domestic Abuse Task Force, and the fact that every division now has a domestic abuse team, specialist team in their area. We've got specialist domestic abuse courts, but not all over Scotland. We've got specialist Crown Office, and um, we've got a lead for Vans Against Women and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscals. We have some legislation, and that's um, absolutely been gathering momentum. And as I say, I will describe MARAC shortly. We've also got MATAC, which is another police led process, which very specifically targets the criminality of perpetrators for the purposes of alleviating the domestic abuse situation so that services can get in to support. For health, obviously, I'm coming from a health point of view. NHS Scotland very clearly recognised the harm that's done through violence against women. And one of the early things we did was around the routine inquiry of abuse, and someone mentioned that in the chat earlier on. And we've got ring fence funding from the government, but that is primarily around third sector specialist services, women's aid, rape crisis who specifically do this work, it doesn't sit with the, the bigger authorities in the, or the country where they're classed as mainstream. So lots of similarities, but also differences. And when I talk about health, we specifically use this model by the World Health Organization, where they did an analysis of the socio-ecological model of individuals' lives, and then overlaid that with the impact of violence against women. And violence against women impacts across all of these elements on the individual, their relationships, where they work, how they're seen in the community, and obviously bound by societal norms and rules. 
And I think this could be a really useful framework for going ahead and looking at the gaps between adult support and protection and domestic abuse and thinking how, how well we are aware across the, all the levels of this framework. So what is it? What do we do then? These are very thorny problems, really big, complex areas. We've got a difficult problem. We know there's lots of information, perhaps in lots of different areas, and not everyone has got every single piece of the jigsaw available to them. But we have to be mindful of adults' rights and that balance between freedom and choice and where we're required to act. So as I say, at this point in time, around most of our practice in gender-based violence, it is consent-based activity of support that we undertake. So if you're at all in doubt, I have to do a bit of promo. Everyone has a Violence Against Women coordinator in their local authority area, and everyone should have a gender-based violence lead in their local health board. Find out who they are, link up with them, okay? Um, they're there to be able to help you work your way through some of these thorny issues. But we still need that permission in terms of consent to share when we're really concerned, and that's where risk assessment comes in. And I'm not planning to go through these. Everybody understands the benefits of risk assessment. What I'm going to say is that when we're going to establish the very high risk conditions that allows us to share information with consent, we use a particular tool to do that. And that's known um, as the domestic abuse risk assessment done by Safe Lives. The underpinning element of that is that there's an, you know there's intention to create power and control. You know that escalation might occur if you start to crack this open and you therefore need to be flexible and responsive in your care planning around it. It's really important to get things from the woman's viewpoint because from the outside looking in, it can look like she's acting quite unreasonably. Um, you have to ask her why she's doing things the way she's doing to fully understand her scenario. Um, we have to recognise that it's not just a single type of abuse, there can be all sorts of abuse and they can be used for different reasons. And we also need to look and see if we know information about what he's been doing with previous partners. You want to create a picture of this man's particular habits and patterns of behaviour. And that's how we're able to piece together the level of risk around. And that's you obviously include other risk factors like if there's alcohol, if there's mental health issues, substance use. And we need to, of course, take into account intersectionality if someone's English isn't their first language, if they're a foreign national, if they've got um, disabilities, if they're older, a whole range of different levels of other ways that people can be oppressed and discriminated against. So the core risk assessment that we use in domestic abuse offers a common language for all agencies to use. And that's really important for us really understanding when the hairs go up in the back of your neck, why everyone is in agreement about that. So who's it for? It's called the DASH RIC. You'll hear people talking about the DASH RIC. DASH RIC stands for Domestic Abuse, Stalking, Harassment and Honour Based Abuse. That's what the dash part is, and RIC is Risk Indicator Checklist. And it's designed to be used for victims of abuse over the age of 16, although please note there is a young person version for those young people who are experiencing abuse within the relationships. It's for people currently experiencing abuse. It's about measuring risk within the last three months, and it also includes honour-based abuse, as I mentioned. And it was devised with the chief officers of police and a whole range of specialist organisations that deal with violence and abuse. You'll get the links um, to MARAC resources. Um, we'll pop those in the chat for you later. The resource for young people can also be adapted for use with people with learning disabilities. And again, if you want more information about that, contact your local Violence Games Women coordinator. One thing I do want to highlight here is the difference in the terms um, advocacy. So in domestic abuse, we talk about an IDA, an independent domestic abuse advocacy worker. And that is perhaps quite different from independent advocacy within adult protection. Um, and there can sometimes be some confusion about that. Um, and IDA's role is very much about risk assessment, safety planning, and the empowerment and support of that individual, whereas um, independent advocacy may sit back a wee bit more. So ours is 
typically more interventionist and it's important to understand that. Now, the DASH right can be used with men, it can be used in same-sex relationships, but be mindful of the fact it was developed with a, a lens that looked particularly around heterosexual relationships and women being the victim. Um, but always ask for advice if you're at all stuck. It's not suitable for use with perpetrators of abuse, and that's what I was talking about, counter allegations. When there's a counter allegation at an incident, the police may do the DASH rick or their equivalent, the um, domestic abuse questionnaire, um, and that might therefore um, ask perpetrators these questions, but it's not really suitable for that. Um, and it's also not suitable for um, questioning children who are um, observing and experiencing domestic abuse between the adults and the household, just so we're clear about that. It covers five main categories of risk. It looks at historical patterns of behaviour, the nature of the abuse that's going on, importantly, the victim's perception of the risk, specific factors involved in the incident um, that's been taking place and any aggravating factors that happen in the wider sense. And there are three parts to how a DASH is developed. So there's the actuarial assessment in the middle, that's the questionnaire. There's also um, the no, the notable recognition of professional judgment being involved and there's also an element that can be used when there is escalation going on in the circumstances. And when I say actuarial assessment that's the static information that we can gather when we speak to a, a, a victim um, and by adding that together we come up with a score. So there are 24 questions in the dash rec and if they, they score more than 14 then that is a pathway and classed as very high risk of serious assault or homicide. The police stack that I mentioned also has those 24 questions, but has an additional three questions relating to child welfare. So we're looking for affirmative responses and if it trips over 14, then that is our impetus to act around MARAC and to share information without consent. It's important to know that you can't pick and choose those questions. You have to ask all of them because together they form that picture about understanding the probability of very high risk of harm. If the person doesn't know an answer or they refuse to give an answer, you should choose don't know and you can make notes to that effect. Um, but importantly, that's why professional judgment comes into it too. Uh, it's not the only way to assess risk. And there are other tools, but the DASH RIC is the recognised tool that's used in Scotland. It's maybe not always as completely flexible for diverse groups, and, but there is free narrative space um, for people from black and minority ethnic communities who might be experiencing very specific abuse in terms of um, from extended family. Right, this I'm not planning to go through all of this and you'll get it in your slides. So this is the areas that we talk about that are picked up through the, the risk assessment. And it was based on research that was done in Wales, where they looked at a whole range of family wipeout scenarios, where the perpetrator killed his wife and then it went on to kill the children and himself. So in the centre there, you'll see we've got the aggravating factors, the historical patterns, those five categories I mentioned. And then outside, we've got the extensions of that. So if you're looking at historical patterns, we pick up his criminal history. We look at how he hurt others. We look at whether or not he is indifferent to senses of whether he's got bail or whether he has to follow conditions. We've got sexual abuse, all the stalking, different types of behaviour down in the um, right hand side. Very specifically in terms of the incident, was there a use of weapons? Has there been a recent separation? Is he threatening to kill anyone? Um, and up in the top corner there around aggravating factors, is there financial abuse? Is he threatening to kill himself? Is there problems with additional um, issues around alcohol? Is there pregnancy in the family? Is there child contact concerns? So this maps the situation by doing the risk assessment and an IDA will do not just the risk assessment, the dash rec, but they will also then do what we call the severity matrix that sits behind it, that looks at severity of what's going on and the likelihood of escalation. So it's really important we use this specific tool and not another tool or a generic tool when you're dealing with domestic abuse. And in terms of professional judgment, um, 
some of that comes from confidence and experience. You will recognise if someone's minimising or denying abuse. You'll understand additional barriers that are going on. You'll be able to identify if there's escalation in frequency and severity. You'll be able to draw on previous experience of other cases because there are similarities through case after case after case um, that you will pick up on themes. And it's not about a gut feeling. It's that whole package of professionalism that wraps around and you apply that gendered lens to what's going on. So it should always be considered along with the checklist and the two pieces of information are important. Um, I've got notes here that sometimes professional judgment will override the score. So say she scores six out of 24, but you are very concerned, you still can act under those conditions but you have to be able to do that in a defensible and justifiable way. And really importantly, the professional judgment should never be used to downgrade the checklist result. So if she scores 18, but you think it's all in hand, you still have an obligation to act after that. Um, you can't decide they're not really at high risk. You have to use both parts together. So you never downgrade as a result of professional judgment. In terms of, um, sorry, missed that wee one out. Um, in terms of following up, and Rick, I mentioned that IDAs will do basic safety planning. Everyone can do basic safety planning. You find out if there's an urgency, you find out if there's immediate risk. We then look at how much information we share and that that has to be relevant and proportionate as for all of our work. And we want to make sure that every woman is offered a referral on to a support service. She might already be working with someone, she might not know about them. It's really important that we all know how to offer that. And again, go to your local coordinator to find out about all your local services. And importantly, we shouldn't be seeing this as standalone or adult protection as standalone. They are complementary and they can run coexisting, they can run at the same time. A lot of times I've heard people saying, oh, we're taking it through child protection, so we don't need to take it to MARAC. Mm -mm. It can go through MARAC, it can go through child protection, it can go through adult protection, it could go through MAPA procedures. You could be looking at all four aspects of public protection in one case, and none of them trump the other. They all should be taken into consideration. So this is a wee sort of pathway. Um, if we come down it, you make your enabling environment, you ask the question, you get your disclosure, you do your checklist. So the MARAC pathway is the one to the right. You get 14 ticks or more, you look to allocate an IDA and you look to um, refer through into MARAC. If it's high risk, sitting at 10 to 13, again, you don't do nothing. There are measures you can do. You look at doing referrals, you look at checking systems and you look to see what supports can be put in place. And even when it's lower than that, it's perceived to be lower in terms of the score on the checklist, you should still be offering services, you should still be making sure that they feel safe to go home. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the conditions for referral into MARAC are that they score over 14, can be on professional judgment, and it can also be on escalation um, or repeat victimisation, as the term might be used. It can come back to MARAC within 12 months if you're starting to see real escalations in rape and uh, other forms of violence and abuse. Now, in our area, we don't apply one of the escalation criteria, which is three police call outs in 12 months, because frankly, we do not have the capacity to do, deal with that. So we mitigate against that uh, and develop our systems accordingly. But all of this stuff ties into Jane Monkton Smith on the homicide timeline. And there's fantastic training available for that online that I would highly recommend and we can get information to you about it. Um, you can map where the perpetrator and the scenario is on the homicide timeline to let you know, um, as well as the dash rec, how things are going. So that's our impetus to act. Um, and it's that definition or defining of what we mean by high risk by the use of that risk assessment that enables it to act without consent. The referral into MARAC is not consent based. Um, the women may choose not to engage, just very similar to some of your adult protection activity, but we feel that we have to act and that's under the Istanbul Convention that I mentioned earlier. 
So some of the profiles we know around specifically on high risk is that there's hundreds of thousands of people at high risk of domestic abuse. Women are much likely, more likely than men to be at risk of severe and high risk domestic abuse. Um, we know that they live with it for quite a long time before it's flagged up. And we know there are lots of children living in homes where there is very high risk of domestic abuse. And that's really been, this whole thing has been developed since the 70s by our sector from Women's Aid Rape Crisis about the recognition of harm done and the need to act. Um, excuse me. And there's your link in with child protection. If you see child protection, you should be going looking for domestic abuse. We know that it features highly on child protection concerns very regularly. This is the suite of legislation. I've just put that in there as a holder for you in case you want to refer to any of it. And in terms of core MARAC agencies, so this is our area. We've got the police, we've got the IDA services, which are typically through Women's Aid, but my service also provides them. We've got social work, different departments, children and families, criminal justice. And we do have adult support and protection in there, but that's typically that social work represent that. That might not be the case in your MARAC in your area. Housing, drug and alcohol services, and AURA is a sacro service that's available in our area that provides domestic abuse services. And obviously I'm from health, so I'm highlighting that we have lots of commitment to it. We've got health visit and maternity, mental health, substance use. We get information from GPs to bring. Um, we have emergency department information and in our area, my service uh, also takes part. So the process itself is pretty straightforward. You've done your identification and your risk assessment. A referral is made. Information is gathered by all agencies that are going to be attending. The meeting takes place. That information is shared to get those pieces of the jigsaw that we talked about earlier. And action planning, very importantly, is agreed at the table. Um, and there is follow up and feedback afterwards. And running through that whole process, you want to ensure that as I does there to support women because they will bring the women's voice to the table and they will also feed back to them um, when it's safe to do so. So none of that is particularly easy, but it's a system that's been put in place and we have processes for. So locally for us in Lanarkshire, we operate um, every four weeks, Amarik every four weeks, in South Lanarkshire, North Lanarkshire, but we've got so many cases that we have to split it into two halves. Um, we have a team of um, recruited MARAC coordinators, and that's funded by the two local authorities and the two HSCPs, and they use a very specific system called OASIS, which is also used in England and Wales, which provides us with really rich information and data around high-risk victims. We've got a partnership operating protocol, and we have specific organisational guidance for our own organisation. So I write ours in NHS Lanarkshire, for example. We've also got a training pack for reps who are going to be coming to the meetings. And we've got um, specific training so that they know what their role is and their responsibilities are. And we also provide general overview training for the wider professional population in the area. And nationally, um, Brenda mentioned that I'm on the National MARAC Advisory Group. So in recognition of the fact this was almost a ground up process that took place, government are recognising that it is a very powerful and useful one. So they did a consultation um, which was hit by the pandemic a bit. So things have been delayed, but it recognised that they really want to move to a statutory footing for MARAC. And this is our first step towards equivalency. Um, the the group are currently doing a gap analysis. There are 35 MARACs across the country now. Every local authority has one, um, but they don't all operate the same way. So we're going to be developing national standards, which will then be monitored against. And as I say, it will be written, written into legislation that MARACs are required to operate in each area and need to be supported. So I can't tell you how delighted we are. Helen Snedden, who is on the call today, um, from North Lanarkshire Council was so innovative and she was the first area person to bring it into Scotland in the North Lanarkshire area as far back as 2005. So honestly, yep, big heart up for Helen. Um, 
and we still have our frustrations. I came in in 2006, God help us, but I can't tell you how delighted we are. And in terms of scale, there were over 6,000 MARAC cases this year, up till June 23 across Scotland. And that was an increase on 30% on last year alone. So this is an increasing area of work um, that every area should be aware of and really nuanced in their understanding of. So, as I say, not easy, but absolutely important. So I suppose bringing it all together, um, a wee bit of poetry for us. Um, you might know the poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. And he said, two roads diverged in a wood. And this is the road not taken sort of poem. You probably would be aware of it. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we need to do is where adults meet adult sport and protection criteria and the harm is perpetrated by a partner or ex-partner and it's characterised by coercive control, we need a response that addresses the needs of both of our arenas. Um, it has to meet adult support and protection, but also be reflective of best practice in relation to domestic abuse. And really that, I think, is why I was asked to come and do this input today. I believe there was a survey carried out across adult support and protection, and this was one of the areas that's really coming up and very prominent at the moment. Yep, there's a big, yep, absolutely. So um, just to sort of wrap us up, this is from the Safe and Together Institute, which is an American institute. You might be aware of Safe and Together, you might be hearing it quite a lot just now, and it's a child protection um, positive um, non-abusing parent facing perpetrator pattern of behaviour model. And again, there's whole training available about that. Um, but this, their continuum of practice is brilliant, really simple for us understanding where our organisations or our structures might be just now. So you'll see down at the bottom end, we have domestic abuse destructive, where policies and practice actively don't support people who are experiencing domestic abuse or make it harder to access support and assistance. Then systems that are domestic abuse neglectful, they have policies and practice, but they're a bit unwilling. They don't tend to intervene or they fail to acknowledge the, the severity and significance of domestic abuse. Then we get into the middle ground. There are policies and practices, um, but we know there are gaps in between them and that we know that there's additional work and training and service infrastructure required. And then we get into the blue section where we have competent policies, procedures and structures, um, but they could be improved. And ultimately, domestic abuse proficient services are fully aware of the landscape, apply that gendered lens and don't apologise for it. Truly understand the impacts and the cross cutting themes that we need to to know about. So I think that's the good way on the top of your head you can think about where are we at just now. So Brenda mentioned that my colleague Julie is off sick um, today so she was going to come along and give a good practice example that's been happening in South Lanarkshire so I will do that for you. Um, and that came about because I was doing adult protection um, for a while covering it for NHS Lanarkshire a few years ago and when I was seeing the AP1s coming through, my team were recognising that at least a third of them had a GBV aspect to them that perhaps wasn't being identified. And we were talking about it through the various partnership work. Um, and I think that started to be recognised more widely. I'm just giving my personal experience of that locally for us. We then saw that we thought we'd do a case file audit. So Julie and her colleague, um, so we had a specialist from Violence Against Women, specialist from Adult Protection, and they carried out a case file audit. And it was from all localities um, selected by the lead officer, Julie Stewart, who is also on the call today. And it was looking at cases that where domestic abuse was the primary harm type. So identified cases of domestic abuse already. Um, the care inspector tool was amended for use for it. And Understandably, it picked up a range of areas for development. I don't think anyone in the call would be surprised to hear chronologies popped up. Um, there was also a minimal understanding of domestic abuse identified. And there was also 
a lack of involvement of specialist services or processes um, and missed opportunities, I think, would be the easiest way to describe it. So that then led on to a report to Chief Officers Group, also went to the APC, went to the Violence Against Women Partnership, and it was agreed that guidance would be created. And I was hoping to be able to share that with you today, but because Julie's off, that's in final draft stage. But I do believe um, that it, we're happy to share. That's really going to be the upshot. Um, and there's a training programme that goes along with that, and I have extracted some of that for use today. And there's going to be a comms package so that staff are aware that this brilliant piece of work has been done. I suspect Julie will be doing a further audit, but I'm not going to um, say that without her being present. And there's also that consideration about whether or not it's proportionate to have adult protection specialists sitting at the MARAC table. So that's our shiny, happy example. So my final piece of work for you to do is I'm going to pop another poll up for you. Um, I want you to just run through. There are eight examples. When considering the combined issues of adult protection and domestic abuse, what have you got in place? What are you definitely not doing? Or what might you be considering? And this is really for Brenda. The results of this poll can perhaps be used for further events that you might have. So let me pull up my poll. Again, it'll pop up in the middle of your screen. If you just complete the questions and press submit. That come up okay, Elaine? Great, thank you. Responses are coming in now. Thank you very much, everyone. It will take a few minutes because there's so many people. Brenda, you'll be absolutely buzzing about how many people you've had in this call today. Well done. I will take time after when Francis is speaking to her. We read in the chat because it looks like there's some amazing comments. It will just give it another wee minute because I'm very conscious I'm almost out of time, Brenda, being a very good presenter, sticking to time. Oh, Alison, you've joined the call today. I thought you were off. Thank you for putting that in the chat. If I'd known you were here, I would have got you to do that. But OK, we're just over um, 100 or so responses. Uh, as I say, I'm conscious of time. It looks like Everyone's planning to raise it with our Public Protection Chief Officers Group. My job is done here. Fantastic. Um, look at reviewing ESP referrals for domestic abuse indicators. And as I say, the door is open. We are more than happy to help if it's helpful for people. Looking at developing joint training. Fantastic. Um, 
not many people are going to steal South Africa, South, South Africa, South Lanarkshire's document. You're all being terribly polite. Um, but you agree, it's a great idea. Fabulous. There's a real strong view about whether adult services should sit at Marac as a core member. That's really positive and we would agree with you. Now, IRDs, I know they're a bit of a thorny topic. I thought I'd throw that in as a bit of controversy at the end there. Um, Brenda, that's really one for you. Um, you'll be more aware of whether some areas are planning to do IRD or not. But you can see that 55% of people are saying um, yes, that there should be specific IRDs that include domestic abuse specialists. So that is brilliantly positive. Um, safe and together, looks like a lot you do know about safe and together. So that's great. Again, I'd thrown that in. Um, and certainly my trainer is a local accredited trainer in Lanarkshire and again speak to your balance game swim coordinator for more information on that and thank you very much for the little word cloud training awareness yep lots of things that we we know will tie this together that's amazing and um, feel free to keep popping your answers in the quiz um, and just to finish us off um, we always do self-care because this is not a comfortable topic, it's really difficult. So my final slide, if I get it to work, I want you all to guess which of these lovely three caterpillars creates this moth? Which one turns into this beautiful moth? I'll add another poll for you. Where's my moth poll? Bear with me till I find my moth poll. You can have a good look at it just now. Here's my moth poll. Take your pick. Someone's got their mic on, but that's okay. But at the end, choose your choose your moth. Is it a dryandra? Is it an elephant moth? Is it an airman moth? Well, bit of a split poll about. 30%, 30%, 30%, but most of you, with 39%, yes, it is an elephant moth. Well done, everybody. Congratulations. So um, this is my contact details. I hope you found that informative. As I say, I know I've crammed a great deal in. Um, the slides will be available to you, and please do phone. It is our my absolute passion in this topic, so please get in touch. And if you've got any questions that are burning in your mind just now, pop them in the chat and I'll respond to them next week. Um, Holly will be able to get them over to me and I'll, I'll get in touch with you. What I'm going to talk about now is the trauma-informed approach to adult spot protection, which is, you know, two big agendas. We've had trauma agenda that's been around for a number of years. We all know about the trauma framework. Um, it indicates practice levels, which particular professions should be um, trained to. Uh, there's the NES modules. So we're all aware of those resources around. But then you, on the other side of that, you've got the adult support protection agenda. And now all of a sudden, the new codes of practice, what it's done is actually says that we have to integrate the trauma informed into the other. So this is the start of our journey for us. In terms of how do we do that? What does that look like? Um, so hopefully, as I say, this is not about this is my views, how you should do it. This is I am very much a mind map person. Um, I mean, I actually took the time to actually sit down and start thinking about, right, what does this mean for us? How do we actually do that? So really, my slides are probably just pulling together my mind map process. Um, and, and hopefully it's something that, that in other groups that we can then take forward. But obviously, from an organisational point of view, we need to look at how do, how do we do it? Um, I don't have polls and uh, everything else. I'm completely relying on people putting in the chat, using your reactions, because I will, you know, seek for people to uh, get some views. So, and can I just say, please don't take a uh, touch the take control because it, as you've seen what happened to Anne earlier, it takes the slides. Um, if my volume starts to dip, just please let me know because it's obviously just a mic on this. It's not uh, very good. 
Okay, so the revised codes of practice. Oh, sorry, what have I done? Uh, the revised codes of practice. Actually, um, I, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of them. I think most people will be aware of them. Um, the specific reference that I've made to the bits that talks about trauma, there's you know, lots, there, it's quite a big section, so I would suggest people actually have a look at it. So what it's actually saying is that most people will be able to safeguard themselves through their ability to take clear and well and thorough decisions about matters um, to do with their health, their safety, and as such, could not be regarded as adults at risk within the terms of the Act. However, what it's saying is we have to make that distinction between people who are unable, um, that's people who are lacking the necessary power, ability, um, as somebody put in the chat earlier, that skills means an opportun opportunity, and that's where that comes up for us. So people who have, you know, they, they lack the skills, they lack the necessary means to protect themselves and the opportunity. And I think Anne's case was coming through quite strongly. There's a lot of those women didn't have the opportunity to protect themselves as well, because sometimes the controls around them were so were such that, you know, they would have lacked the opportunity to actually you know, tell someone what was actually going on. Um, so the other side of that is people who are unwilling. So we have to make that distinction in adult protection, and that's where the trauma aspect comes in. So we, I, I'm not going to um, emphasise the whole undue pressure. Anne touched on it several times in our presentation. And um, for me, this focus is actually looking at, it's the presentations that we encounter in day-to-day -day basis with adults that may have an indication of a trauma background that up until now we probably have been up we know about trauma um particularly social workers who are online it's the core of social work training um we've all went to training events conference events where uh, trauma has been discussed so we are um, very familiar with trauma but for us it's about Maybe we're not so good at actual labelling and naming and actually identify, we, we identify the presentations, but we maybe don't record them. And we're not maybe making that link um, as clear between those behavioural presentations and the, um, the person's inability to safeguard themselves. So basically the new code of practice is saying that we have to consideration should be given to the factors that may have impacted upon the uh, the adult with the effect of impinging on or distracting from their ability to make free and informed decisions to safeguard themselves. And that's where the undue pressure comes in and the other particular it talks about particular circumstances around trauma. So it's saying trauma-informed practice is an approach to care provision that considers the impact of trauma exposure and the individual's biological, psychological and social development. So these are quotes that are coming through the, I'm not going to read through every quote. But what it is telling us is that we have to take a trauma-informed approach to adult support protection practice. That enables us, or those who perform any of the functions under that, to better understand the range of adaptations and survival strategies that people make to cope with the impacts of trauma. So I'm going to talk about a piece of research here, and it's a very dated piece of research. It's 2011. I'm going to ping it to um, Brenda, and Brenda will ping it out the slide. It's called Emotion-Based Decision Making, um, and I'm only making reference to it because when, it, when I read this piece of research several years ago, um, it made lots of reference to the behavioural presentations that, that we might actually see. And I revisited it a couple of years ago because I was doing a Council Officer Reflective Practice session. And um, we used the bit of research and we talked about it in terms of the, the trauma aspect, aspect of it. And the reason I like this piece of research is because it actually talks about um, people's emotional arousal and distress, Things like anger that makes it impossible to fo focus on issues, um, you know, around le making legal based decisions. Um, it also talks about the impact of uh, feelings are more likely to dominate in certain situations. 
There's four conditions make it more likely a person will use their feelings as an alternative or as a shortcut uh, than actual factual information. Sometimes we even we talk about capacity. We talk about you know, people making uh, decisions based on facts. But sometimes what they're saying in, in this piece of research is not all people will make decisions based on fact. They will make decisions based on their emotions. And it talks about when a judgment to be made as effective, for example, it is about whether or, or whether to like or trust someone. We've all encountered that. When little or other information is available, um, when the judgment is cumbersome or complex to make in the basis of ordinary information, and when time constraints or competing demands limit time and space for thinking. Now, I, I, when I identified with that, I thought, you know, as a, a practicing social worker, you know, sometimes I think we could put people under time pressures. It actually talks about the importance of history and memories. Um, and it talks about that drip effect of negative experiences on decision making. So there's lots of bits in it. Um, I actually just want to talk about motivation and drive. And this is what I liked about it as well, because it actually talks about people who are so stuck in the ways that they, they do things the circumstances that they live in, that when we're asking them to make decisions that takes them out with that comfort zone, and it's that how it upsets the whole emotional regulation, and we can then be dealing with a lot of behavioural presentations. So I'm going to send it because I think it's a really, really good, because it gets us, for me, it really got me to think about the adults present, people's presenting behaviours. Are we very good at actually looking at and identifying and labelling and naming naming them and actually then, um, you know, as, attaching them, I suppose, to their historical um, histories and memories? So I'll go back to uh, my uh, PowerPoint. So as I've mentioned, the NES modules, having done training, having read bits of research, um, what I actually thought was a trauma-informed approach to adult support detection was doing this. That I would look, you know, I would observe for people's changes in their behaviour, the body language, you know, their environment. I would explore, you know, think what may have happened, how can I help them? I would think about their safety. I would look at what is their needs, and do I have an understanding of their needs? And um, can I explain? Their behaviours, and then I would try support and protect, signpost. So I thought naively for me that that was a trauma-informed approach, and I thought then all I had to do was this, you know, apply the the R's, you know, look at it in terms of I recognised it, I was responding to it, um, I was uh, forming that relationship. So it wasn't until I actually started delving into it a bit deeper and I looked at the Scottish Child Investigation Model. So I thought, right, well, there, ha there is a piece of um, protection practice which has had input from NES, Dr Caroline Bruce, heavily involved in the re revamp, because that used to be called the Joint Investigation tra Model Training. Um, and she was heavily involved in the uh, revamp of that whole model to make it much more trauma-informed. So when I've looked at that, I've thought, mm, maybe I'm not going down the road that I, I, would, I thought was, we would be going down. It's not just about labelling it and taking a different approach to how we're working with people. It's much more widespread organisational change that has to take place. And is, is there anybody else out there that was quite naive like me who thought that if you had a good grounding in trauma, that that meant you were trauma informed? Very small minority then. Get a, a wee hand went up there. Robin? Just saying, You're on mute. Uh, just saying, this is fascinating, Francis, because uh, like you, yeah, I would, I would 
this is an eye opener. I'm really interested. So what I then went away and looked at was uh, another really, really good document, which is the NES Trauma Informed Practice. Uh, it's a toolkit for Scotland. Um, so all the NES resources are widely available. Um, so I, I, I mean, I don't even think I need to put the links in, but if people need them, I actually have the actual documents. Just contact me and I'm quite happy to send them on or I can send them to Brenda. Um, so when I looked at that toolkit, what I actually then seen was it was a bit more than that because it talked about the five key, five key principles. And that there's the principles there, so I'm not going to read them out. Safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, empowerment. You can read the other bits and you'll get the slides anyway. Um, so what I looked at was, what does it say in that toolkit? Now that toolkit says, a trauma-informed practice requires a systematic alignment with these five principles, along with a change at every level of or an organisation. So for this reason, the implementation of a trauma-informed approach is often described as an ongoing process of organisational change. So the more I read into that toolkit and the more I thought about what do I know about adult support protection, the systems, the processes, the practice. So then what I started to do was actually think about, right, for an organisational level, what does it mean for us in, with an ESP? Now, I don't have any, I, we can't change the whole organisation that we work for because, you know, there's trauma programme leads who are linking in to do that. But certainly we have to look at it in terms of um, the adult support protection agenda. So for me, this was about um, identification of specific goals, targets, depending on the agency setting, the context and priorities. Um, the bits that stood out for me was a trauma-informed uh, fit with principles, policies, procedures, and uh, they have to be revised accordingly and they have to align with the trauma-informed principles. We have to identify key areas for change where practice risk, uh, pra where practices risk re traumatization. Now, for me, that came through an investive interview. It came through uh, case meetings that we have, case conference meetings. It could be core group meetings, um, and it could be use of protection orders. And Francis, the slides seem to be stuck. Can you tell us what slide you're at? I am at the slide seven for organisational change. So maybe mm. you have, maybe the, the gremlins are starting again, Anne, because I had There's, to do that when you were presenting, I had to go out and in a couple of times. A few people in the chat are saying that, so just as long as we all know, we should go on seven. And yeah. That's lovely, thanks. Sorry about that. Right. So I'm just going on to slide eight, which talks about um, collaboration. Now, these these are not um, new. They're new, not new concepts. They're just new in the sense that we have to look at specifically to adult support protection. Um, so the cl collaboration aspect is about that inter intra and inter um, agency sector data sharing where appropriate regarding trauma histories. Um, we have to establish shared understanding of adversity and trauma across systems, staff levels, and disciplines. And that's where it's so important for partner agencies to do the trauma training as well, because it means that we are using a universal language and we all understand. Um, we all understand concepts such as adverse childhood experiences, that when we're talking about trauma, that people have a sense of what that actually is. I'm not going to go into trauma because we could talk about complex trauma all day. We could talk about, you know, single event trauma, PTSD. We could talk about the impacts of it. Um, for me, it was looking at it as a lead, a lead officer's lens and a training and development lens. Um, again, you know, that multidisciplinary case conference, core group meetings, including prioritising service user engagement, you know, both adult carer if relevant. Now, these are not, not these are not new concepts to adult support protection because we know that the principle of participation is there within ASP. So it got me to think about workforce development. 
you know, what, what does that require? Training. So training dependent staff roles covered by the NES frameworks. Again, we've got lead officers for trauma who have the responsibility of trying to filter out that information across their organisations. Um, but what I started to think about was how do we use a uh, use use of group of forums such as learning collaboratives to embed a trauma informed and reflective practice, consolidate learning practice and um, change. My experience in tra uh, training development was most of the practitioners that I was working with, particularly council officers, really did have a good grounding and anchoring in uh, a trauma knowledge. For them, it, it's it's maybe this um, has brought about a shift in terms of, as I'm saying now, what we have to maybe get better doing is actually labelling, identifying what the behavioural presentations are and making those connections with the person's histories. And it, it, we would maybe do that, but we might not be very good at recording it as such. So, And it might be a confidence issue as well, because a lot of staff do have, the, when you talk to people, they do have the knowledge but they maybe just need a wee bit of confidence building in terms of making it's a I suppose a hypothesis sometimes unless somebody's actually saying this is exactly what happened to me and this is how it's, it's affected me but we work with people who don't have that level of insight and understanding so quite often it's us that has to make those links so they need access to ongoing trauma-informed so supervision so it's not just adult support and protection supervision they need the adult support and protection supervision, but also trauma supervision as well. Um, the other bit is evaluation processes, embedded, uh, embedded TI training initiatives. So again, we have to look at, you know, how are we evaluating that? Do we use things like our thematic lead officers using thematic practice reviews? How does training build it into their evaluation processes as well? We have to look at evidence-based dissemination of selected resources material to support ongoing learning. Francis, just to bring to your attention that Kirsty Stobo's got a hand up. All oh, right, sorry. I can't see. Kirsty? Shall we? Much must be. Brenda, if she comes back and sticks her hand up again, will you let me know? Because sometimes if I can't, if it comes up, if it's a wee circles, I can't always see if somebody's. Yeah, it can be tricky to see when, you're, when you're actually presenting. So, um, yeah, yeah if, it, if it goes down and comes back up again, I'll let you know. Right, that's I'll fine. put her hand down just now and then we'll know if she puts it up again. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Holly. OK. So we um, again, it's uh, include. I, I'm I'm just going to home in on some of the the bold point, points because that's the bits that you know kind of jump out. As I say, you get the slides, you'll be able to go away and think about this and build. I'm hoping that this is a foundation that we can all start to build on, um, and that would be lead officers in the training and de uh, learning and development network as well as the national groups. So including the adult care, if relevant and the trauma-informed DSP training, either directly via integrating a perspective and training materials. Um, we had our trainer con training conference quite recently, and we had a woman, Joanne, who created a video for us. She did come along on the day as well. Um, she was very brave to actually talk about her particular set of circumstances, where it was her son who was, uh, who was putting her under undue pressure. And the good thing about that, um, I mean, it's awful that she experienced that, but it was good for her to be able to talk about it. And we were very, very able to clearly identify the uh, relational base. Because she didn't want to, it was her son, she loved him, she didn't want to get him into trouble. She knew he had his own health issues. She was able to talk about all that. So it's a very good video. Um, Joanne's quite happy for that video to be used. and training um, and I, I've got the actual video and if there's any um, MD interested in getting a copy of it, get my details off of uh, Brenda if you don't already have my details because I'm involved with the other groups anyway um, and I'll be happy to share that. 
There is another video which has been around for a few years and it's a woman called Wendy and that was developed under the old National Adult Support Protection Coordinator who was Paul Comley. Um, and I recently had a meeting with Wendy and um, again the, the video is very good and they're very, very good for using to, to get groups to talk about that um, identifying the trauma experiences you know, within and undue pressure. Um, the Wendy one's very good because her mum had lots of, um, there was alcohol, there was mental health issues and there was, at that time, it's quite an older video, but it's quite good to use as a reflective video to actually get people to think about how has the practice changed since then and if we took a trauma-informed lens to that scenario now, what would we do differently? Because I think the practice would be quite different. And she, when I was talking to her, she was saying, you know, it would be great to know that, you know, the practice has actually moved on since her experience because, you know, she works for Health Improvement Scotland. She um, is a very articulate woman and she spoke about the challenges of trying to navigate the adult support and protection process at, um, in relation to her mum. Um, I think that's on, Brenda can double check, but I'm sure it must be on the, the IRIS website. It will still be out there on the NAPC website somewhere. So I would imagine when it's migrated over that Brenda will have um, access to that. So that we are starting to build up that resource base that we can all use and share material that actually helps us drive forward this agenda in relation to adult support protection. Um, obviously, there is the availability of the training that's available via NES, the e-learns, which I'll, I've got a link I've mentioned. Um, another part of the toolkit actually talks about staff safety and well-being, relevant staff uh, training to understand vicarious uh, traumatisation, that secondary trauma, um, which we don't think about. And that was something that I had to step back in a couple of years ago and I thought, we, when we do investigative interviews, we talk about debrief to check our notes with our second worker who's actually scribing that interview. And we're checking notes for accuracy that we've captured the right information in relation to the adult. But what we don't necessarily think about is we don't do a personal debrief in terms of what has this raised for us? Has this, is, is this scenario, you know, triggered? Because we, we've, you know, we forget as practitioners that we all have our own histories and, you know, there are scenarios that might come up that trigger things for us. So that's something that I've had to go away and think about and how do I then build in to our, tra tra our investigative interview training um, a part that actually looks at not just about debrief around the work, but it's debrief to recognise, did this bring anything up for you? They might not want to share it but we need to be pointing them to the right services to get support for that. And that might be through our occupational, um, what do we call it? Is it occupational health services? Yeah. Um, so through our own, uh, I know most organisations have that now, they have uh, access to talking therapies. So. Uh, the, and the other part of that was the availability of le regular staff and team debriefing learning and support forums, in particular after significant incidents. So obviously that, you know, if it's an, a very challenging investigative interview, um, you know, that that could be used within their team, you know, to, to help support the person. So I think we need to get better as well, actually looking at how are we actually, and even, sorry, another thought just came to my mind there, you need to admit, because this is where my brain goes, it's in a hundred directions. The thing is, we have case conferences. We need to think about the minute takers who are taking the minutes. The minute takers are being just as exposed to that difficult information and, you know, hearing about that person's experiences. And sometimes we don't even, we, we talk to colleagues about it, but we don't actually even think, what type of impact is that having on my, my minute taker? And that happens in child protection as well, not just adult protection, or the minute takers for child protection. So it's that secondary trauma. So it made me much more aware of thinking about, you know, secondary trauma for our staff. 
screen and assessment. Because what it's saying is we need to, we really should be screening when we are doing um, inquiry work. So we need to consider as part of inquiry that it's not where we're using investigative powers, where we're going out and having that conversation with the adult, because that that that's it. That's the bit that might be easier to get information about their history. But it's when we're doing those inquiries without the use of investigative powers, that desktop process, we all know that the biggest majority of adults for protection referrals are processed at that point and do not move beyond that. We can all look at our data and we can all see how many progress beyond the desktop process to actually going, at, you know, it's desktop process, with collecting information, talking to other professionals, um, and quite often we then make a determination of the three point criteria, which quite often is it's not meeting the three point criteria, or sometimes they meet the criteria, but we refer them on to maybe other support services. So quite often we're not, how are we going to get access? How will we know that person's experienced trauma? When we are making that determination through a three point, th through a desktop process, we might be missing information that actually might bring the person in to meet that three point criteria because we might get information about trauma that we can then see is impacting on their decision making, which then we can actually see, well, they are meeting the criteria because this is per this is a person who is then unable to safeguard themselves. So how do we do that? That's complex and I think that's a, an area we're all going to have to think about. It's, I think it's far easier when we go out and we're doing some kind of invasive interview with the person where we can actually speak to the person. So practitioners um, are clear why and how routine screening information will be used. Um, it is better to regard than discount the adult's experiences of trauma. And that's again, we might read a record, we're doing the desktop process, we might um, read something that actually tells us about something's that there's trauma in their background. We can't automatically think, oh, they've had trauma, therefore they're unable to safeguard themselves. But it's for us to be mindful of that, that, well, you know, we, we can't disregard it. We have to actually be mindful that, is this coming into play here? How might it be coming into play? Is the harm suggesting there's a, co a, a connection between that event that they've encountered in the past and their current presenting behaviours? or the current context in which they're being harmed. Um, Trauma-informed screening assessments um, is routinely discussed as part of the council officer oversight of non-council officers conducting inquiries. Now, that's me specifically going into parts of the code of practice. You know, where desktop processes don't always have to be carried out by a council officer. They can be done by a non-council officer, but they need to have a council officer oversight. So that council, so we are, so we are um, asking for what those. What time study getting here? Sorry, can, uh, somebody's mics <laughs> unmuted. Um, so it's that that asking. Ch uh, sorry, I've been a bit thrown. Um, what was I saying there? Somebody mind me. That's my way of checking these are all listening anyway. Francis, you were talking about um, non-council oh, officers. Yeah, yes. So it's that that's a check that's the, the council officer oversight is you now checking out, you know, has has the person considered that their decision making has been impacted by trauma? Um, is there any indications of trauma in the background? Would the behavioural pre presentations, would the harm suggest that? Um, so also incorporating trauma-informed screening into existing systems and uh, or assessment processes. How do we do that? Trauma-informed screening assessment is routinely discussed at team meetings and included in supervision. Service user involvement. That's no, that's been around for us in ASP for a long time. And it's always been an area that we've found particularly challenging. But it's a core aspect of a trauma-informed approach. You know, that person's, it's a bit 
trusting relationships, empowering the person, um, giving them choices, keeping them safe. So when you look at the principles of trauma, they very, very nearly align with the principles of adult support protection. So establish a commitment to decreasing um, agency adult power differentials. That's the core essential of the trauma informed approach, but it's also, you know, basically what we're trying to do. It's very, very hard in protection contexts because you always have those um, power differentials present. How do we how do we how do we minimize them as much as possible? So these are quite quite difficult practice challenges, I suppose, that we have to think about. Um, because it's sometimes we have to override, you know, adults' participation. They might if we can actually indicate that they are not making choices that are free from, you know, they're not they're not fully informed decisions or they're not from the undue pressure of others. So sometimes the adult may say we don't want to engage and we may have to override that because we know that there is undue in influence and pressure there. And I think the recent Mental Welfare Commission report, um, I think it came out last month, um, is very, you know, that that's kind of very entrenched within that report. And I, I would suggest for anybody that's interested in undue pressure and adult protection, and to have a look at that port. So establish a routine mechanism for adult care, not exclusive to ASP, but also how sensitive uh, were we in screening for trauma or when we use invasive interview or through the ASP process. You know, was the five R's a trauma-informed approach there? Could we see it? Monitoring review. So we need to measure staff's knowledge their awareness and confidence in the trauma-informed principles and practice. So that overlaps with the organisational development. Um, establishing clear goals with regard to pra uh, pra practice outcomes changes desired. Uh, utilise or adapt current systems to audit, monitor progress and evaluate trauma implementation. Um, regular communication with staff and services about trauma implementation progress and ongoing learning, monitor, mo monitor the uh, model, implement a uh, fidelity check. So these are part of that whole bigger organisational development process. Coaching and mentoring and um, coaching, mentoring and monitoring of fidelity to the trauma informed model through supervision. Does anyone get any points so far? You all look, I don't want these to be absolutely bored because I find this stuff quite interesting, but then I can be quite a geek in that area. No questions? No. There's lots of points getting popped in the chat, so don't worry. We're oh, is there? My chat's not, oh, it's moving now. It's maybe because I'm presenting, I'm not scrolling through. Um, Francis, I just want yes. to check what what's the, what the number of slide are we on? We are on thirteen. Right. Okay. Do you want um, me to stop presenting and try reloading? Do what Andy. Yeah, I think that might that... be an idea. I'm on slide eleven, and I've come out and come back in, and I've tried syncing to presenter, and I'm still on slide eleven. So if you could do that, that'd be brilliant. Right. I will stop Bye. sharing and try and upload them again. Because sometimes I, I know it's that work to be done that a couple of times. Um, how do I share again? See, this is I have to go down and find my slide. Right. But can you see them now? Yeah, I can see them now, but it's slide one. Is it moving now for you? It is for me. Yeah. yeah, not for me, but mine's weren't when when Anne was presenting either. I might right. try going back out and coming back in again. I can't see any of the slides now, so I might go back out and come back in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Sometimes I had to do that a couple of times when Anne was presenting, leave and come back in. Um, it could just be intermittent connection issues. Um, 14, the physical environment. Yeah, we're on 14. Yep, we're in 14, physical environment. And that, that's a big focus in the practice toolkit. Um, so we, you know, our offices are not great. They're not designed. When I look at the changes that has been made in the offices um, for child protection, we've got contact rooms, which are lovely. And I think, you know, when we are seeing people, not for investive interviews, because the investive interviews primarily take place in a person's home. But it then made me think about, well, is that always the best environment? Because if harm has taken place there, you know, might that be re-triggering? So I suppose for us, it's about where do we carry out these invasive interviews? Where do we carry out case conferences? Um, in fact, anywhere that we have contact with the adult. So we have to think about, um, you know, where is that environment a retrieval cue for that person? Where might be the best place? Um, because council officers can visit uh, and conduct interviews in other places. They can go to if the person attends a centre or you know wherever we need to interview the adult. The act you know basically says that a council officer can visit and interview the person elsewhere. Um, but it's case conferences. We had, I think, my, I don't know if my colleagues online, but we actually, after our, we had our trauma and ASP trauma informed conference um, at the beginning of October. And it was after the conference that we were contacted by a, a practitioner who then says, we've got a case conference coming up. Um, would it be OK to have the case conference in the person's house? Um, Obviously, you know, there was good reason for that. Again, uh, you know, it's it was a trauma when, when they when she went through the case, it was a trauma informed approach. You know, it was taken into account that coming to an office in a meeting room would have been re triggering a lot of past um, memories for that person. Um, but the good thing is as well, is it got them to actually think about streamlining who's actually going to attend because it's it's you know they're going to be crammed in a, a room um so it's very individual for each person and that's what that person wanted they didn't want to come to the office they weren't going to come if we were having a case conference in the office they weren't going to attend and they said why can't you come to my house and do it here because i don't want to go to the office because of a b and c um, so, so they did what they, they could to accommodate that person. Possible barriers, you know, lack of understanding and of the experience and impact of childhood trauma, professional reluctance to shift, lack of quality supervision, reluctance to ask about early adversity and trauma, pressures such as high caseloads, workload pressures, High staff turnover all require consideration um, in a trauma and adult support protection implementation planning. Um, the complexity and the range of trauma makes a comprehensive screening um, a difficult task. Do we actually need to know about the specific details of the trauma? Um, you know, could that be re-traumatising the person? Is that enough to know with the information that we've got through about the adult? Do we actually need to know the ins and outs? You know, investigative interviews can be quite detailed in terms of the who did what, you know, how, you know, how how did you get to that room? Um, you know, what did they say? Uh, you know, it's that level of detail. So we need to think about is this level going to be tra traumatize this person? Are we watching? For triggers that we are re-traumatising this person, how do we focus or shift? How do we shift our focus? So the thing is now what I'm looking for is, you know, what how do we systematically align all the practice associated with adult support protection to the principles of trauma? 
Has anybody thought about it to that level of detail or is that just me being So what I've I'd started doing, and this is where this is where my mind mapping comes in. Um, I can see a hand up. I, I can't see a name, but I can see a uh, Angela. Um, hello. So I'm a probably a wee bit different to everybody here, and I'm one of the trauma leads that are across Scotland. So I sit within South Ayrshire, and. Um, this is something that I think is really important that that it was what you said earlier on about that we think we know a lot about trauma because we work within it every single day. But when it comes to something like making trauma informed systems and services, I think it's really important to allow time for this. And we are really trying to obviously kind of push this agenda in South Ayrshire. Mm -hmm. And I work really closely with the Adult Support Protection Committee, which I'm part of. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that I think it's a really important kind of point for us to really be kind of focusing on and understanding. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, someone else put a hand up? They're in a wee circle, so I don't was, see your name. Was, Heather, Heather, yeah. I think. Oh, Heather. I, I, I suppose it was just to do with what, a lot of what you've said, um, Francis, about the importance of it. And so in, in Northland, we probably about 18 months ago, we started to look at it with the support of our, so we've got a trauma steering group, which again is led by the, um, the, the, the trauma leads. And so some of the things around having that consistent approach, so across partners, all linking in through NESS, looking at this not as a protection issue, but actually having that separation of actually when it does hit protection, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, some of the language that we use has been really important. And um, we've added a couple of questions in. So we use the care inspector audit, but we've added a couple of questions in around the language that's used and if we can see a trauma-informed approach and very much when we do the training now we no matter what training we do across public protection we always include a section on trauma-informed so we're asking people some of those questions that you've been that you've been raising there about yeah. that so yeah. but I think the way that we're looking at this has to be the approach fits and somebody put the notice in about some of the discussions we're having about contextual safeguarding as well. So if we think about this as an approach, not a model, it's out how all the models incorporate it. And that's a really long term cultural shift. Um, so at the moment, it's some of it is about those those quick wins that we can have about prompts. But mm -hmm. a lot of it is about actually a change in culture. So, yep. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So what I'd, I'd started to think about was I started looking at the principles and what I actually started to think about was key process, processes associated with adult support protection. Again, I'm not going to go through I've, I've bold points. Supporting an adult at risk of harm is paramount importance. Now, that's 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 the TI principle, but that's the core theme of adult support protection. So we can see that, that there's already principles, some of the principles is already enshrined within our own principles within adults protection anyway. Um, and the whole kind of overall um, aspiration of adults protection. Uh, this includes uh, ensuring reasonable freedom from threat or harm. Again, you know, that's what's there in our three point criteria. Um, and remain alert to the possibility of undue pressure. So obviously I've put that bit in because that, that is our act uh, in our uh, in attempts to f uh, and in our attempts to prevent further re-traumatisation. An ASP inquiry activity, how do we make those sensitive inquiries about trauma histories? And I'll come back to that point because there was a good wee pointer in the toolkit. So again, safety, it was asking about trauma and abuse uh, presents a societal shift in the visibility of childhood and adult trauma. Um, possibly open uh, with someone like us, someone, the other people we work with have sometimes had difficult childhoods. Is this something that you recognise in yourself? You know, something as simple as that, that's what was in the toolkit. And you're thinking that's not you know, it's not 
a complex thing to do. If that's if that actually helps to take us into that uh, explorational aspect of you know the trauma informed approach, then that that is that would be quite easy for us to embed that within our practice. Safety. So limiting the amount of people that an adult has to repeat the traumatic history to. You know, that comes up time I've already told that person. So if we think if there's a criminal invest parallel investigation is taking place, you know, police, they are, we've got a ASP investigative activity occurring and there's a, a parallel police investigation and that person's recounting that trauma. So again, it's, you know, pra practitioners and other professionals can attend to trauma um, trauma and its impact without actually focusing on it. Investive interviews must consider known or potential triggers and are conducted in a way that promotes the adult feeling physically and emotionally safe. Practitioners, again, this is me moving on to the next uh, trauma principle of trustworthiness. Practitioners are more likely to have a positive effect on the adult being harmed um, and their situation when they are clear about their role and responsibilities. The, this involves uh, keeping people informed of any changes, telling a person when will we be, be if we're going to be late, if you know, we're going to be late, using simple language, being accountable and transparent in what we can and cannot do. Now that that's that's what's in the trauma toolkit, you know, as what kind of you know comes under each each part. I mean, I, when you read through a toolkit, I was just picking out bits that I'm thinking, well, that kind of aligns with some practice that we already do anyway. I think this part is is already embedded within our practice. Take a compassionate approach, incorporating your ability to adapt and modify your approach and the questions uh, a topic covered. Caution where the adult uh, required is, is required to relive and explain what has happened to them. Uh, at the time of the alleged harm, this can potentially be harmful if this uh, re-triggers the emotions, the most of the emotive event. So it's for us, it's actually how do we manage that in investive interview context? Um, you know, it takes us back to earlier points, practitioners and professionals can attain to trauma um, without actually focusing focusing on it. So trustworthiness again through the consistent communication of empathy, warmth, being treated with respect, being listened to and encouraging, promoting hope, it can aid the development of a trusting relationship. So that's there, you know, but sometimes we need to think about, you know, ASP work has time constraints, um, you know, pre the, your, that very often is done within the context of practitioners managing lots of other work. Um, so sometimes there is that bit, you know, to the, 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 I suppose you feel a bit pressured that I need to go out, I need to get the person to talk about what's happened to them um, when, you know, we might be actually, I suppose we, we could be making the situation worse for that adult. And we might have an adult who disconnects when they're so, their, tra their trauma responses are triggered. So if they disconnect and they shut down, they're disengaging, then how do we, how might we interpret that? You know, they don't want to engage. A choice. So again, another principle, Every effort should be made at each stage of the process to ensure that the, the that barriers to the adults' participation are minimised. So again, that's the core principle of adult support and protection. So you can see how the while the wording might be different, the underlying themes behind the trauma principles is probably already there in most of the principles associated with adult support and protection anyway. Adults have meaningful choice and voice. In the decision making process. Well, we do that. We try and promote advocacy. 
but we know the uptake of advocacy can be quite poor in an um, adult support protection context. We know that's an issue. There's a national group that looks at that particular topic. So how do we actually improve that? And I think that case conference example um, actually does reflect how we maximise that person's ability to engage in that, that case conference, because otherwise they would have said, well, I'm not coming to that meeting. And we know the adults attendance at case conference can be an issue because we've probably all got it as a thematic practice review of what we look at uh, quite regularly. And it's probably part of our data analysis as well. Choice, investive interviews, ask the adult where they would prefer to talk about the alleged harm. Now, should an investive invest interview, interview be uh, required? You know, do we have enough information from other sources, other agencies? Um, that actually tells us what happened to the adult. Do we, you know, do we need to, to know the ins and outs and the detail? Do we need the adult to confirm, you know, what took place? Would that be suitable? So these are things that we maybe need to think about. Ensure people understand the limits to confidentiality before sharing their trauma history. You know, and that's that's we can share information about an adults at risk of harm and we don't necessarily need their consent to, to share that information. But if they tell us about their trauma history, well, that's completely different. If we are trying to get people, you know, we don't we don't want um, adults retelling their stories, but there might be important connections between those trauma histories and their current pre behavioural presentations that um, is, is relevant for other agencies that we work with to know. So we need to think about, you know, we might not need, we might not need consent to share concerns about harm, but we might need to think about asking the adult, are you okay if I share this with relevant partner agencies who are involved? you know, in your case, because it might help them better understand what's going on. Trauma survivors may convey distress non-verbally, um, for instance, by losing concentration. You know, they might disconnect. That might be that emotion-based decision-making paper that I referred to earlier actually talks about all this, and it's so good. It's such a good read. As I say, it's very dated, but it's still very current when you actually read it. Um, practitioners can look for cues, you know, is the person feeling anxious or distressed, um, asking is it okay to talk about this, you know, when we're, do, do you need a break, do you want to stop, you know, are you okay to continue to talk about this or do you want to you know, not talk about it? Um, consider how they will cope after the conversation or interview. Quite often we ask people at the end of an investive interview, you know, how are they, how are they keep, you know, how are they, we do check in how they're feeling, but we generally check in how are they going to keep themselves safe. But maybe this is another dimension of it, as, you know, how are you going to cope with what you've actually talked about? Who's around to support that person? Um, I think I've put there, investive interviews are done in a way that minimises the sense of control that a person has over the process and minimises the risks of re-traumatisation because I think they can be particularly difficult situations. You know, you get two practitioners there quite often. One's taking notes, one's asking questions. Sometimes the person that's taking notes is coming in and asking questions. You know, we talk about those power differentials and that's a bit about sometimes the trauma principles you know, um, might align better with other parts of practice. So we need to think about, well, how, how do we make this whole scenario better? But we have got specific statutory functions that we have to carry out, and investive interviews are part of that statutory function. Um, if the adult doesn't want to talk about um, harm, the situation, the situation where life's harms occurred, do not prompt too hard for information. I'm not going to read that because people can pick up these slides 
any ASP meetings that ask the adult where they would like to have their meetings. Now that's that again was in the practice toolkit. Um, is it good practice to is it it is good practice, sorry, to consider ways to check um, at various stages with the adult, the adult, how included they feel and ensure that they have the opportunity to highlight if they feel excluded at any, any point. Again, that fits with the principles of adult support protection. Avoid using jargon. You no, know, we talk about that all the time. Um, adults are actively encouraged to contribute to their ESP plans. Um, so again, collaboration, explain things in a way they understand, check that they understand. Um, a few days before any case conference, you can arrange to you know, arrange to talk to the adult about what will happen at the case conference, get everyone to in introduce themselves um, and tell the adult why they are there. Uh, again, these are just points that um, I've lifted for the practice toolkit that I've thought, well, that's quite relevant to the work that we do. Um, Recognise when the adult needs a break um, and ask the adult to indicate that they need a break. Um, empowerment. The adult's existing skills are utilised and they are supported to develop new ones. Uh, effort should be made by the practitioners to give adults stro a strong voice in addressing needs around safety, developing resilience and improving their lives. And again, I've highlighted the advocacy support. Um, and this is me getting to my last slides, and this is just the um, screenshots of the resources that's on NES. Um, and again there, just to promote them. Uh, Angela? Um, thank you again for that. It was fabulous, and I agree. The Scottish Toolkit is a is a absolutely great place to start. Just want to let everybody know that today, hopefully, it's meant to be the new um, NES kind of transforming um, psychological practice um, page is meant to go live today, as well as the improvement service have been working on a roadmap. So this actually gives us almost like a kind of framework of what we're needing to be doing to put this into practice and that's also meant to be getting published today as well um so hopefully hopefully yeah. it'll be by the end of today these resources will be out for everybody to to start looking at their service with okay thank you that was really that was nice timing then wasn't it that the launch of that today you think i'd timed that well but <laughs> OK, so that, that's me um, done my actual presentation. Again, I'm, this is not in any way, here's how we should be doing this. This is us at the beginning of our journey. And this is why I said it's an exploratory. And hopefully there'll be some pointers within there. I mean, it's great to hear Heather that they um, seem to be quite far along in their journey. Um, but I don't think that um, Renfrewshire AS, the trauma informed in ASP, we're quite there yet. I think we're beginning to look at it in terms of our policies because we're revising them in response to the codes of practice. But we need to actually think about, you know, how do we incorporate these principles much more? Um, certainly when I'm going back to training, which is in a couple of weeks' time, um, I'll be looking at how do we, you know, make how do we have the trauma informed principles entrenched within the training material as well. So, Anne, you're on mute, Anne. It was just to say, uh, because I sit on the National Trauma Implementation Group, I had a quick look and there's an email in. It's live. I've popped the, the link in the chat. Good. Good. OK, so I can hand you a, I think I'm a wee bit ahead of time, am I? Or behind time? You're, you're right. just a minute, you're oh. one minute past time. You've done fantastic <laughs> well at keeping to time. It's it's really tricky. Um, so you've done a, a, an absolutely grand job. Francis, thanks so much for that input. Um, I know you were you were not trying to say that you had all the answers, that you were asking lots and lots of questions rather than trying to answer all the all the, the, the potential questions. Um, but much appreciated, all really relevant. I think particularly uh, for the lead officers that are on this call, uh, along with others and, and uh, adult protection committee conveners, et cetera, 
thinking about how they really embed practice, uh, trauma-informed practice within processes and within policies. Um, I am going to go on to the chat now and just add a short link, I hope. Right. Bear with me a moment, that should be the... So that's a link, I'm going to ask you not to click on it just this second till I just explain to you this, that's a link to a short evaluation. Please take about five minutes to fill that in and please be as, you know, certainly if there's anything you think we did really well, I highlight that, but please be critical. We're trying to, this is the first of these that we've done, we want to continue to improve them as we're going along. Um, so if I could ask people to click on that link, uh, just while we're here on the call and then come back straight onto the call uh, straight afterwards. That would be really helpful. And Elaine's going to then take us uh, through a kind of plenary session. So if you if you have a look at the link, at, start answering the questions. And then when you've finished the questions, give me a thumbs up, a, a kind of reactive virtual thumbs up. And I'll know that most people have, have managed to do that. Thanks. Brenda, sorry, but the link that's in the chat, I don't know if you have had a chance to do it yet, but it's the trauma and the brain video that's there, just there's no link to the evaluation. I know there is, oh, it's, it's a wee bit further just up. Go back, just oh, go is it back. further up? Yeah. Ah, got it, thank you. You got it, right, great. I was, I was in a pa panic mode there, I'm thinking, how have I managed that? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the most IT savvy, but that's impressive. <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. I wonder, Brenda, if I, I should just say a few words while people are finishing that off. Would that be OK? Uh, yeah, I think that yeah, would be conscious, just conscious, conscious of the time and, and people have sat for a, a long time just um, listening. So and I don't want to keep people any longer. Um, so just thank you very much for, um, for, for, for sticking with it. Hopefully you've uh, enjoyed it. Um, and certainly I have learnt such a lot today. Um, so thank you very much to Anne, who very clearly set out the similarities between violence against women and um, ASP. Um, that was great. And the, sim and the differences. And, and I think, um, you know, um, it made a lot of points that I think are really relevant. And I think Anne will be picking those up and moving them forward and having a further debate about those. So thank you very much. And Francis, um, you you were very challenging there in terms of having to think about practices, but you also gave a, a load of really good examples of how to take a trauma informed approach that I think all of us can take away. So thank you very much for for your input as well. I, I think it's been a fantastic morning certainly um the number of people who've joined us thank you very much it's been obviously been of interest to people as well um so thank you for that um uh, big thanks to Brenda and the Learning and Development Network for setting it up and, and uh, doing all the organisation and for Holly organising the, the, the links and everything as well. So a big thanks to everybody for, for the organising of that. So um, I'm just going to go um, following over words for me was I think right at the beginning I said hopefully this will be aspirational. I think it is. I think there's a lot of challenges there about how we can improve our practice. So um, that has certainly ticked my box in terms of um, today. And again, inspiring and inspirational. It certainly has been for me. Um, we learned such a lot here. Um, uh, and I think we could um, yeah, continue with that discussion and that sharing from, from today. 
Um, we will be having another event. I think we're planning a face to face one next time in February, which will perhaps help with some of the discussions and <laughs> in terms of getting together and, and having that sharing. But it's been a, a really, really helpful uh, event for me, very informative. And again, just a big thanks to you all for joining, but also to our speakers and our organisers. So um, I hope to see you at the next one. Um, which um, hopefully will be in February, so you'll hear more about it. So a big thanks to me and thank you for filling in the forms as well. So is there anything finally, Brenda, you wanted to say just before we say goodbye? I suppose just to thank everybody for attending. Thanks for their interest. It has been really, really nice to see such a kind of wide range of people and to reassure people that the working group for the Learning and Development Network will be getting together soon to have a look at those evaluations and really make it meaningful that we're going to be sort of changing things to try and incorporate some of the, the issues that no doubt people will have, you know, the things that people like, the things that they would think we could have done better. So we'll definitely be uh, meeting very soon next week, I think, uh, to start looking at those. Thanks very much. <laughs>